Good morning, colleagues in Kansas. Good morning. I think just those in Kansas, um, the rest of us in other parts of Africa, perhaps good afternoon, good evening, and so on and so forth. Um, you are very welcome to this course, which is a course that has been arranged as part of a, a GBIF, that is Global Biodiversity Information Facility Supported Capacity Enhancement Project. It's actually a project titled Enhancing Capacity for Biodiversity Data Mobilization and Use in Support of Sustainable Development in West Africa. And the idea is that this course intends to build capacity specifically, but broadly for Africa with respect to the essential biodiversity variables. And it's to be a course that will run for three days uh, today, then on Wednesday, and finally on Thursday. And we are privileged to have one of the most respected and experts in biodiversity informatics in the world. Uh, for many of us who are in this field, he needs no introduction. He's well known, affectionately called town. Uh, <laughs> but his real name, it's uh, Andrew Townsend Peterson. I know he doesn't like using the Andrew, which is of course a very good name and nice name. <laughs> He is a university distinguished professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and the Biodiversity Institute at the University of Kansas. He has been extensively be involved in development of biodiversity databases. And if I should say more recently in the development of the biodiversity informatics training curriculum, which it's a program that has built a lot of capacity uh, in Africa. It's an in-person training course at various sites for students from Africa. And I have been privileged to attend at least two of these courses and I can attest to the benefits of the course. Um, most of the inf rich information resources about this course are available online for wider usage. Uh, Professor Peterson has been very productive um, and his lab at KU has been championing not just uh, biodiversity informatics, but a, a range of um, issues, uh, health, biodiversity, and he's one of the world respected persons with respect to um, ecological niche modeling also. Um, we are privileged to have him as our resource person for this course. Um, and so you, we will hear from him. And I believe at the end of this course, we will leave more empowered and energized to mobilize biodiversity information regarding the essential biodiversity variables. I must say before, I hand over to him that we are grateful to JBF for the sponsorship and more so to the Biodiversity Institute at KU that is providing this, uh, hosting this course and more especially to Professor Peterson. So I will leave uh, for now for him to uh, take us through what he has for us today. And perhaps we might have some little time to uh, for comments or suggestions or questions. So, Professor Peterson, we are in your hands. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, it's very nice to, to see everybody, if not meet everybody in person. I think we all would have would have preferred to, to do this um, somewhere on your side of the Atlantic and, and be able to, to get to know each other more, more individually. Um, but such is, the, such is the age of COVID, right? Um, I hope that each one of you is safe and that your families are safe. Um, I see some, some masks on around the, the Zoom screen and you know, we, we do the same thing whenever 
we step outside of the house. So, so this is a this is a difficult year, and I hope that events like this and and others can at least bring something productive to the year because it's 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 I think frustrating for everybody. Um, so we're we're talking about um, essential biodiversity variables, and that's a that's an interesting proposition. Um, so I'd, I'd like to start just with maybe in the chat, what is biodiversity? Just, you know, take 10 seconds and write out what's biodiversity for you? It's not a, a straightforward topic. And that's, that's the, that's the interesting thing. I don't see anybody writing um, just a definition of biodiversity. I can give you some options. Um, all of the different kinds of species that we find on the face of the earth. Um, all of the broad diversity of natural systems that we see on Earth. Here we go from Layla. Uh, biodiversity consists of all living plants and animals with their genetic makeup. Okay, good. Um, what about the processes that they, that they um, produce? Does each species just exist separately? Um, rather species interact, okay, includes the variety from, there we go, now things are coming in, all the variety of life on earth in all its forms and all its interactions. Species communities, yeah, that's another dimension. The variability of living organisms on earth. Okay, so <clears throat> right away you see that biodiversity is not just a single list and it's probably not just a single database. And so <clears throat> that leads us to, to speak about something that's many dimensional and very complex. And so it certainly complicates our lives a lot. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> so I'm going to set out to, to introduce to you essential biodiversity variables, and notice that they're in those three words are in capital letters, as if they are a specific set of essential biodiversity variables. Um, and then there's also the essential biodiversity variables that might not be capitalized, which would be things that describe biological diversity, um, but aren't part of that official list. And I think we need to talk about this concept of essential biodiversity variables in both of those senses. So I've asked you this question, what is biological diversity? So let's, let's look at essentially the, the um, essential biodiversity variables in capital letters. Um, probably most of you have seen publications by or used data from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Um, this is a, an intergovernmental organization that began quietly, but notice down here at the bottom, um, 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. Okay, that's fairly high profile. Um, <clears throat> And what does IPCC do? But it, it deals with climate and climate change, much the way we might want to work with biodiversity and biodiversity change. And so a number of years ago, this concept of, of an IPCC for biodiversity, it actually exists, it's IPBES, um, Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Nowhere near as, as well known as 
as IPCC and much younger also. Uh, but as soon as IPBES began to be discussed, it was very quickly pointed out that, well, in climate, you have these, these uh, essential climate variables. Why don't we have essential biodiversity variables? And so um, this is a, a set of concepts that was, was cultivated and developed in the framework of the Geobon um, and, and IPBES as well, um, and led to a few years ago, this publication, you can see it's got one of those classic long lists of, of authors, and it's published in Science, one of our revered uh, leading journals. Uh, and it has this simple title of Essential Biodiversity Variables. And notice these are in capital letters. They even get their own abbreviation, EBVs. So let's see what this, that the, this concept of EBVs is. And essentially, they're, they're intended to provide a first level of grouping or abstraction between low-level primary observations and high-level indicators of biodiversity. Now, low-level and high-level don't reflect importance, but it's the difference between something that's very granular and individual. I saw this species in this place at this time versus an overall broad scale indicator that maybe a policy maker or decision maker needs to pay attention to. So these variables, they should be able to capture critical scales and dimensions of biodiversity. They should be biological. Um, they should be state variables, which is to say they should be things that you can measure. They should be sensitive to change. Ideally, they would be ecosystem agnostic, which is to say there should, we shouldn't be measuring one variable that's particular to deserts and another variable that's particular to, to rainforest. And then they should be technically feasible, economically viable, and sustainable. Now, I'm going to give you an introduction to the whole set of EBVs. I'm going to give you detailed introductions to three of them, but then I'm gonna come back around to this last uh, requirement of technically feasible and economically viable. And you'll see, I hope, that those are rather complex for, for EBVs. Okay, so the way this was conceived was that you know, you all and I go out and we do our primary observations of biodiversity. It might be records of a particular species or descriptions of a community or measurements of ecosystem function. But that those primary observations can then be grouped in this set of six essential biodiversity variables, species traits, ecosystem function, ecosystem structure, species populations, genetic composition, and community composition. And then at a higher level, which is to say a broader national to international level, those essential biodiversity variables can be linked to other things like um, the drivers, it might be human population, it might be economic development, it might be climate change, um, and the political drivers, and that that could be linked all together into scenarios, and I guess there should be even a higher level of action uh, to avoid biodiversity loss uh, and loss of ecosystem services. And please, if you have questions, go ahead and, and just unmute and, and um, Ask me questions whenever you wish. Okay, so we have these, these six essential biodiversity variables. These are the ones in capital letters, right? These are the ones that are on the official list. And right away, you can see that each one of them comes with, with more than just one thing that you measure. So we say genetic composition. Well, that could be, you know, 
gene sequences, but it also has something to do with phylogeny and co-ancestry, allelic diversity, genetic differentiation among populations, um, genetic differentiation within species, um, genetic variation within populations. And so right away, we can start to guess that each one of these six is gonna turn into a world of its own. And in fact, several of the people on this call, uh, Alex and Jean and, and Fatima and, and I, I guess, um, several of us have put major amounts of, of time and effort into just this one sub-element of one of these essential biodiversity variables. So these are, these are big, difficult concepts. Uh, that science paper provides uh, this table with the, the six classes, examples, how would you measure? I'll make, I'll make this uh, presentation available to you all. So don't, don't worry about scribbling down notes. Uh, the temporal sensitivity of, of the variables, how feasible they are, and then also um, how, what, what are they relevant to in the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is kind of the, the overall international commitment to these questions, at least at the country level. Uh, a lot of us are committed to these questions because we're fascinated and interested in them. Um, but countries get interested because of the CBD. Okay, again, this, this column of feasibility, I really want you to pay close attention to this. Um, and I'm gonna point out right away that at least two of these uh, EBVs can be addressed globally, essentially immediately. Okay, ecosystem structure, an ecosystem function can both be mapped, not comprehensively, but mapped globally now. It doesn't give all of the things we'd want in that, in that dimension, but it certainly gives a lot in each of those two dimensions. And then these other four dimensions that's where things get complicated. Any questions on this so far? Okay, so the IPCC has this wonderful data distribution center. And any of those of you who have, who've done work with um, future climate, um, questions regarding biodiversity. For example, uh, Ben Freeman and, and Alex Asase have both um, published papers using data from the IPCC Data Distribution Center. And this, is a, this is a fascinating thing to go and play with. Uh, it's not terribly accessible, which is to say the data come down in difficult formats, but essentially what IPCC did amongst many other things, but they got all of the big climate modeling centers to agree on a set of experiments. And essentially they got all of them to set up climate model simulations, they're called general circulation models or GCMs. Um, they got all of those modeling centers to set up GCM simulations for the same set of initial conditions. And they essentially ran an experiment to see what each one of these models would say about a particular set of, of conditions. And they've now been through five or six generations of these, of these simulations. And so each, each um, IPCC generation gives a whole new set of insights. And so this is really, this is an example to emulate 
and this might be kind of the disappointing part, but um, you know, Geobon and Ipbes have have started to try to do this. And so, for example, um, EBV class ecosystem structure, uh, global forest cover loss. And this is a data set that was, was generated from uh, Landsat 7 using observations from more than 600,000 images using Google Earth Engine to determine per pixel tree cover using the supervised learning algorithm. And you can, you can click through this essentially between, uh, between years and you'll see something that is pretty neat globally. The map is kind of horrific. Uh, if you notice Antarctica is a little too big and Greenland is a, too, a little too big um, because they've, they've used an unprojected map. Um, but as you click through this, especially if you zoom in on your country or your study area, you probably will be disappointed. Maybe the same is true for the climate data, but, but just the, these few initial global products can be pretty disappointing just because they're, they're initial. Uh, here's another one, which I did not like at all because uh, I'm an ornithologist, but changes in local bird diversity. So changes in bird diversity at the grid cell level caused by land use, I guess land use change, estimated by the CSAR number model. It reports changes in species number relative to 1900 for all bird species, forest bird species, and non-forest bird species. Um, I can tell you pretty quickly, this is not gonna be very rigorous, okay? I'll just say it that way. I won't say the word bullshit, okay? Um, so we come out to these, these, these essential biodiversity variables and maybe we just saw an, a couple examples that were, were related to this part. Um, but what we see is that each one of these is lifetimes of investment in developing ideas, developing conceptual frameworks, uh, developing tools and data. And so this is a massive scale undertaking. In many senses, it may be bigger than the IPCC undertaking was. Okay. Any questions about the overall view? I know you have questions. You guys are being shy. Okay, I won't bother you then, but uh, do ask questions when you have them. Okay, so let's go into, as I said, I think I, I promised you three of these. Uh, genetic composition. This is kind of a fun one, has one of my favorite examples to begin with. Anybody know what this is? Very famous photograph from Scotland. Uh, this is a photograph of the Loch Ness Monster. Okay. It was probably a bigger thing when I was young than when a lot of you were young, but back in the 70s and 80s, there were, you know, there were whole movies produced about what could be the Loch Ness Monster. Could it be a remnant dinosaur? Um, you know, is this what gave rise to all the, the Mariner's legends about, about um, sea monsters? Well, very recently, um, there's been a first effort to answer this question. So here is Loch Ness in Scotland. Um, if everybody could mute, that would probably be best. There we go, thank you. Okay, so a team from Otago University in New Zealand essentially went into Loch Ness and just collected samples, water, soil, whatever, 
and looked for weird DNA that would perhaps indicate uh, an animal that, that doesn't fit within our usual parameters. And essentially what they found was, well, no dinosaurs, uh, no giant crocodile or anything like that, but perhaps um, a novel species of eel that might be able to, you know, put its head up above the water and look like uh, a sea monster. Uh, another example, uh, essentially doing biodiversity inventory of sharks based on DNA recovered from okay. seawater. And so we have papers being published that says, notice this, environmental DNA detects 44% more shark species than traditional underwater visual censuses and baited videos. And this work was done in Caledonia in the Southwest Pacific. So these are the, this idea of genetic, tech, the genetic techniques is awfully exciting because it really can, can be an in, uh, a, census, a sensor that detects the invisible. So in this figure, you can see that the environmental DNA work detected all of these sharks that none of the other techniques detected. Now this is all becoming possible because the, the cost of genomics is declining massively. Uh, just 30 years ago in 1990, the cost of sequencing the human genome. Okay, we need to mute a bit. Let's see if I can fix this. Okay, if you're talking, if you could please uh, mute your microphone, it would be much easier, I think, for everybody. Um, anyhow, 30 years ago, the cost of sequencing yeah. one vertebrate genome was three billion US dollars. <clears throat> and it took 13 years. And now the cost is about a thousand dollars and it takes just a couple weeks. Okay, so this is extremely exciting and it makes all of this this sort of work that is based on, on genomic studies, it makes it quite a bit more feasible. And so I'm not gonna go into a lot more detail, but I will say that there are enormous uh, genomic databases out there, uh, in particular, Ensemble and GenBank and, and things like that. And you have, the, you have at your fingertips right now, uh, literally billions of, of gene sequences from millions of species. This is very, very exciting because it, it makes a lot of things possible that were inconceivable just a few years ago. Oh, here, here's some examples from GenBank. Um, this is uh, the growth of GenBank, different divisions of GenBank, um, over time, I think it's in the last day, oh, annual increase, sorry. Um, mammals, not human, I assume, 60% increase. Whole genome data, 43% increase. Primates, 3% increase. Viruses, 17% increase. And then if you look at the number of base pairs of gene sequence available on GenBank, you know, obviously the big ones are all human uh, associated um, organisms, but it, those are still in the billions of base pairs. And you can go down, I mean, look, this is a Kiwi, okay, with 1.5 billion base pairs of data. And so this is incredibly rich information that if the right 
tools and frameworks are developed uh, can turn into rich insights about biodiversity. And so this is what a query looks like. And you can see um, that the, the different groups that are represented. This was just for the country of Rwanda. And you can see that um, 963 chordate species have been sequenced from Rwanda and only 131 arthropods, which is probably terrible, uh, 171 vascular plants. Um, we'll come back to these questions, but suffice it to say, there is a lot of data out there. And that's what genetic composition data in GenBank look like. Uh, red means a lot of data and um, the, the black countries mean no data available and the white uh, countries represent the other end of the spectrum from red. Um, so again, lots of data out there. I'll show you that map again in a moment at the end of the talk. So that's, that's one of these EBVs, just to give you a bit more um, detail than the, than the list. Now let's talk about community composition. And so this is, this is really important stuff, and this is economics. Um, here's a paper talking about rebuilding global fisheries. And global fisheries are all about fish communities, okay? And because it's economically important, it means you have tons of data. Um, and so these are global catch data. Uh, what you're seeing is the, the natural logarithm of the average reported catch from 1950 to 2004, okay? Uh, I mean, these are huge amounts of data. Um, and you can essentially use those data to build models of um, at what point can you rebuild if, you're, if your yearly exploitation rate down here, where you exploit relatively little, you can rebuild these fishery stocks. And up here, where you over-exploit, exploit, you cause uh, even, even species collapses. And you can see those uh, increasing as you go from left to right in this figure. Then here's an, an interesting map from the same paper. Okay. Uh, talking about small-scale fisheries and how they can be uh, rebuilt or, or destroyed depending on how fishery activity happens. You can also see, you can also see um, developed nations moving to the waters of, uh, off Africa to do their fishing. That's, that's a, one of those big, large scale um, political questions out of having data available. Let's see. Okay. So here's, a, here's a, another study of community composition. This is one that my students and I have been developing. Um, you can see Ben Freeman in here. Um, he's on the call today. Hi, Ben. Um, and this paper was essentially an effort to take the, uh, the overall set of very rich data on bird communities across the United States and Canada and assess biodiversity change or change in bird faunas over about 70 years. And so what we did was we took all of the, um, all of the bird data available, which were in the, in the range of hundreds of millions of records. And then we filtered and looked at just at the records from before 1980 which is to say before 
global warming really started to ramp up. And we came up with 159 sites that were well inventoried. And there's a whole set of inventory statistics to work with that. So 159, you see they're more concentrated in the East than in the West. Um, and that gives us a picture of community composition before climate change. And then down here at the bottom, you see a bunch of those sites X'd out. Well, what we did was we asked for those 159 sites that were well inventoried before 1980, how many of them are also well inventoried after 2010? So that gives us 30 years of climate change as essentially an influence on bird faunas. And so again, we lose a bunch of sites, but we still have 108 well-surveyed sites that we can look at. And so we looked at uh, levels of turnover and you can see they go from high in the bright colors to low in the, in the, in the dark colors. And you can see that the, the avifaunal turnover is probably focused up here in the Northeast. You can look at species lost. And so the darker colors are more species lost. And then you can look at individual species. This is one that's very close to uh, my heart here in Kansas. I live right here in, in Eastern Kansas. And this species, Timpanucus cupido, had a range about like this. And now that range is more like this. And notice that all of the historical populations are now lost. And then we were able to do some, some analyses that, <coughs> that showed uh, different factors. So we looked at, um, well, I'll point out the important ones, the, the really cru crucial ones in terms of, uh, of climate are temperature change and precipitation change. And what you can see is that every, in every one of our, our uh, statistical models, I'm not gonna go into details, but in every one of them, precipitation comes off as significant, which is to say it's in black, and positive, which is to say where temperature increased more, the loss was greater. So this is just one early study of, of climate drivers of biodiversity dynamics, but it's at least very interesting. Now, we can do this sort of work also uh, on, on global scales. And as I said to you earlier about, about the land use change maps, I don't think you're gonna like them or I hope you won't like them. So uh, here's a paper, range size and extinction risk in forest birds. And here is uh, my response to that, basically saying, uh, let's, let's not put too much effort into this sort of work. And essentially what these authors did, the, the Harris and Pym uh, group, was they took these data from the uh, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which are just these polygons. You can see these gray shapes for every species of bird and mammal and I think amphibians uh, and fishes, certain fishes. Uh, and they basically just stack them up and use them to count species or use them to characterize species distributions. And so what we did was we showed that, you know, just look at this species, for example. Yes, those polygons from IUCN summarize the major features of the species range, but they also miss many, many occurrences uh, and they miss many established populations. So there's going to be this temptation to use uh, these data that are that are quick and easy, and I would also say highly inaccurate. And so you can go to the map of life, 
um, which sounds pretty promising, right? And you can say, uh, you know, tell me everything you know about a particular species. Here's Takus decani in, in Northeastern Africa. And you get all this cool information. You get occurrences, you get range maps, you get uh, threat levels and things like that. And there's no way to download the data. So I'm not happy with that either. So where we come back to is what I call primary biodiversity data. And again, this is the sort of um, data resource that a bunch of people on this call have put major, major effort into uh, producing. But these are individual granular data records that say a particular species at a particular place at a particular time. Okay, so for example, for Turacos, a couple years ago when I made this slide, there were 200,000 records online. For this one species of, uh, oh no, sorry, this is for all species of corvids in Mexico, there are 183,000 records online. And so, this is nowhere near as convenient as those maps, those range maps, but the data are likely to be much more accurate, which is to say they refer to a given species at a given place, and they can also have documentation. It might be an herbarium sheet or a specimen in a museum or a photograph or you know, an observer's um, name that says, well, this person with this level of experience recorded this species. So that's, that's kind of a, a, a brief introduction to community composition, but it also verged into this next EBV and the last one that I'll talk about in detail, that of species populations. Um, and right away, you can see this is going to be a, a messy, heterogeneous EBV. Are we talking about populations in terms of number, indiv number of individuals? Are we talking about population dynamics? Or are we talking about the geographic distribution of populations of species, or even just the, dis the geographic distribution of the species per se? And the answer, of course, is yes, which comes back to my, my refrain in this talk, which is that these things are really complicated. Okay, these, these, um, these EBVs, none of them is simple. None of them is easy. So ideally, we would have comprehensive population data for every species on Earth. And ideally, we would, we would be able to create indicators for this EBV that would be things like, well, are native, rare, and endemic species increasing? That's a positive indicator. Are they decreasing? That's a negative indicator. Um, or for invasive species or pest species or species associated with disturbed habitats, well, if they're in the increasing, that's bad. And if they're decreasing, it's good. And the funny thing is, it's classifying these species as you know, good versus bad or desirable versus undesirable is place specific. So for example, there's a, there's a pine tree in the Western United States that's restricted to this one tiny range in California. And there it's an endemic species and it is a species of considerable conservation concern. But it was taken to Southern South America as a timber tree. And there it's a terrible invasive species. So that right away we see that these population data and these indicators that we might develop, they kind of have to be specific to individual places. So first I'm gonna tell you about two efforts that have been developed 
to try to develop indicators like what I just described to you. Um, the red list index is a first one. It's an indicator of the changing state of global biodiversity. It defines the conservation status of major species groups and measures trends in their risk of extinction over time. Okay, they've been calculated for birds and amphibians. So all the rest of you, people who study plants or people who study mammals, sorry, okay. Um, but red list indices have been developed for those two groups. And there's a whole bunch of, of uh, publications of this sort. Uh, so biodiversity indicators based on trends in conservation status, measuring global trends in the status of biodiversity, et cetera. And so essentially, you guys know these, these classifications where you say, uh, you know, this is a species that's common and in no danger, so it's least concern, near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, extinct in the wild, or just extinct. And obviously, good is over towards this end of the spectrum, and bad is over towards this end of the spectrum. And IUCN has developed um, specific criteria for, for this, these, these classifications. So for example, we could take critically endangered, and that would be a species that has seen at least a 90% loss in its population. I'm not sure the difference between those two. Uh, has a very small range. Uh, has a very small actual area of, of occupancy, has a very small actual uh, population of individuals, or uh, has a uh, extinction risk of, um, it looks like this is a, a well, I'm not, I'm not sure why it says greater than 10% and then greater than 20%. Anyhow, uh, you could do a, a quantitative extinction risk and, and essentially predict that this species has a high probability of going extinct. Um, and this is a, a tally of how many species are in each of these categories through time. This is for birds. And so let's, let's look at that critically endangered category. Interesting, starts really high, probably because a lot of species were very poorly known, and then came down massively. And then you can see it just kind of wobbling up and down. Uh, here's one that's total of extinction, extinct in the wild down to near threatened. So all species of conservation concern and here you see a little bit more clear trend of low and then up a bit, sorry. So it's these status changes and where those species are located that are what are being used in the red list indices. And so you can see um, the red list index is getting worse through time between 1988 and 2004 and this one. Um, and you can see just that, that um, it's a pretty dismal outlook. Um, you can see this uh, compared to um, what the red list index would look like given a couple kind of hypothetical scenarios. Um, you can see it by region. And so you can see neotropics and afrotropics are um, doing relatively better than other regions, um, probably given uh, large extents of rainforest. You can see it by, by realm, terrestrial and marine forest, uh, grassland. You can see it by family. But 
red list indices, first of all, they depend on how accurate those threat assessments are. They depend on the frequency of threat assessments. There's no single list, much less multiple lists at different points in time of what the plants of the world and their threat levels or the sipunculid worms of the world and their threat levels. And so they are, red list indices are restricted to well, relatively well-known taxonomic groups. Um, and then I'll just throw in a comment. This is just one picture from, uh, from one of the meetings that develops these, these, um, these indices. They're not always representative of the scientists and the communities across the regions that, that are um, contributing the, the biodiversity. So um, th there's also kind of a political and human dimension to this. Okay, here's another attempt to develop a global scale set of indicators for biodiversity health. This is called the Living Planet Index. It tracks the state of global biodiversity by measuring the population abundance of thousands of vertebrate species around the world. Latest index shows an overall decline of 60% in population sizes over the past 50 years. Um, so this is interesting. You could imagine population uh, data being aggregated from around the world, from each of your countries. And you can imagine looking and asking, well, what are the big trends in these data? That could be really interesting. Of course, we'll have the problem of do the data exist? So uh, you can, again, this is a, a set of indices. It's been, it's been presented in a bunch of reports with the Living Planet Index. Uh, and essentially you can see, you know, okay, fishes are apparently doing a bit better um, sorry, no, these are the types of threats. And you can, so you can see fishes threatened more by exploitation, reptiles, amphibians, and birds a bit more by habitat loss, uh, things like that. Now, are birds really more threatened by climate change than mammals? Or maybe are there more studies done? Well, the Living Planet Index globally, uh, they've essentially tracked these, these uh, population indicators. And what they're show showing is that relative to 1970, everything's gone downhill. Now you guys know that's not completely true. Um, some species are increasing or some species are increasing in some places, but overall, Apparently, the trend is downward. And you can see big regional contrasts. Uh, look at the Nearctic region where I live. Um, that, that, um, that downward trend has kind of flattened off and even maybe perked back up. Whereas in the Neotropical region, it's going downward. Afrotropics downward, although perhaps a little bit more stable. Indo-Pacific rapidly downward. Uh, the Palearctic slightly downward. So again, we're getting these, these um, highest level indicators. Um, probably all of you are familiar with the concept of garbage in and garbage out. I think we have to be careful of that. Notice this. Um, this is the global distribution of the populations being monitored that go into creating the Living Planet Index. And so notice Europe, and to a slightly lower degree, North America, 
are pretty densely covered with population studies. Indian subcontinent, Australia. But then look within Australia. It's all coastal areas, and there's almost nothing going on in the interior deserts. Or look at Asia. Parts of China, Japan, Korea, and India, there's a lot of information. The rest of China, Central Asia, Russia, no populations hardly at all. Look at Africa. I know you were looking at Africa. It's all East Africa. And what do you guys think is being monitored in East Africa in largest part? Probably big charismatic mammal species, right? So we have to be really careful when we say, here's what's happening in Africa or here's what's happening in Australia. We have to be awfully careful of the data that are going in because we're very, very vulnerable to that garbage in, garbage out scenario. So these are just some, some views that come out of um, different sorts of data, uh, looking at numbers of species. And obviously, if you contrast this slide with that slide, there's kind of an inverse relationship where some of the most diverse regions are least well represented in the Living Planet Index. So um, I don't know what to make of these, of these papers. I think there's interesting content, but I'm not sure that I um, believe and endorse that these are relevant at the level that they have been portrayed as being relevant. You can see lots of papers published in the best journals. Okay. And you could also see kind of um, sensationalism based on this type of thinking. Um, that result is probably not likely true. Okay. But living planet indices, highly biased spatially, only takes into account 1970 to present, based on far more data from the North than from the South. And you really cannot go finer than a single region. Why? Because you're aggregating those many studies across a region. So with my colleague, Jorge Soberon, a few years ago, um, we developed the idea of working at the level of within a country or within a region, but being able to develop uh, indicators of biodiversity loss. And essentially our argument was that these global uh, indicators like Living Planet Index and Red, Li Red List Index, they are by nature, global indicators. And they really cannot be downscaled, certainly to local levels, and probably only infrequently even to national levels. And so um, we developed this, I can make a copy of this available. In fact, any of the papers that I've mentioned, I can, I can get for you all. And essentially what we showed was that primary biodiversity data, remember those are data records that place a particular species at a particular location in geography at a particular point in time. And what we want you to see is that on this semi-log plot, the number of biodiversity records produced per year has increased by an order of magnitude every 42 years. So in 1850, there were a few thousand records being produced per year. In 1900, there were tens of thousands. In 1950, there were hundreds of thousands. In 2000, there were almost a million. 
But this is, it's not just that the records are accumulating, but the numbers of records are, are exploding, okay? And so this is a real contrast to the red list indices and the living planet indices, which in my view are information limited. And so we did things in that paper, we did things like uh, look at a bunch of species that are restricted to rainforest. This was in, in Mexico, which is where Jorge is from and a place where I've worked for many years. Um, and so we looked at a bunch of species that are from rainforest, which are these, these um, solid lines, and a bunch of species from pine forest, which are these uh, dotted lines. And this is estimated distributional area through time. And what I want you to see is that the pine forest species have lost quite a bit less of the extent of their distributions than the rainforest species. Now, we could do this much better. We could certainly do this much better now, 10, 12 years later. But what, what I want you to see is that, um, is that you can develop biodiversity indicators on local and even and, and subnational levels. Now I'll remind you that all conservation happens at lo local levels. It doesn't happen nationally and internationally. It comes down to whether, whether a particular place conserves its integrity naturally or not. And so if it doesn't work locally, and if the planning is not right locally, it doesn't matter if somebody says that this country is a big priority and that country is not. Okay, it either works locally or conservation doesn't work. So Geobon Ipbes have, have this EBV of species populations, but I'm, I just wanna remind you that it's complicated, okay? Um, definitions, um, the probability of occurrence over contiguous spatial and temporal units addressing the global extent of a species group consisting of one to many members. That's pretty complicated. Or in terms of abundance, the predictive count of individuals over contiguous spatial and temporal units. And so in this, in this paper that those definitions come from, uh, they have very complex diagrams, uh, kind of laying out a conceptual framework um, for, for what this EBV would look like. Now, as far as real data, um, you know that the primary data exist thanks to GBIF and other efforts. Um, and that's essentially who's sponsoring this, this course. Um, but there ought to be other data resources. So you look at this one, the Global Population Dynamics Database. That sounds promising, doesn't it? Uh-oh, dead. Um, that's bad. Um, LTER network. So this is something that uh, began in the US, long-term ecological research. It's now been extended beyond the US, but not, not globally enough. Um, and from the LTER, there's, there's quite a bit of information out there, you know, mark recapture of rodent and shrew populations in a declining hemlock stand at Harvard Forest impact of urbanization um, on small rodent abundance and community composition at Arizona State University. Um, these data can be heterogeneous, let's say, but they are there. Uh, and this is what a data package looks like from LTER. There are lots of data packages at Dryad, which is 
when you publish a paper, frequently you're, you're requested to deposit your data there. And so I did a search for population and I got um, computing the local field potential from integrate and fire network models, uh, hidden dynamics in the unfolding of individual bacterial rhodopsin proteins, ancestral gene flow and parallel organellar genome capture result. So right away you see extreme heterogeneity. Okay, it's gonna be hard to find the data we want. Here's another data set. This is, this is uh, neat. Uh, compadre and comadre, which means um, the godfather of your son is your compadre, and the godmother of your son or daughter is comadre. Um, that's about plants and animals, respectively. Uh, that's in, in Spanish. Um, these are databases of matrix population models for hundreds of plant and animal species. And there, there are some neat data sets in there. Uh, the Reef Environmental Education Foundation uh, with databases, geographic area reports, distribution reports, etc. Really, we come down to GBIF, to be honest with you, to get any hope of, oh, look at that, who's on, on this page? There's our good friend, Jean. Uh, but we get the possibility of global scale data. 1.6, it's 1.3 when I made this slide, but it's now above 1.6 billion records. That's a lot, okay? And with the proper frameworks and tools, it's possible, as I hope I've shown you, earlier in this EBV, it's possible to develop useful views. And the coverage for GBIF is, is pretty massive. That's, that's the world and an indication of relative magnitude of data resources. Okay, so we've just gone through three EBVs in detail and then and I gave you previously an overview of the whole set of EBVs. In this last chunk of this talk, I just wanna give you a little bit of a, a, a notion of, of caution, a caveat emptor, you know, the buyer beware, please. Um, and this, this is a, a paper, another paper that Jorge and I did, uh, where we said essential biodiversity variables are not global. And this was, this was out of concern because we were worried that, that all of the, um, the oxygen was being sucked out of the room by the, the biodiversity equivalent of IPCC, which is to say we were worried that, that everybody would be so focused on EBVs and contributing to the global effort that they would forget that those EBVs are not going to be informative for everybody around the world. So this is that, that list of, of six EBVs. What class, what class? Rosario, what do you mean? And essentially these are the data sets that we explored to give you an idea of the geographic distribution of the data. And so, for example, from GenBank, we pulled out the 49 million records <clears throat> where country had some value. And then we made our best effort to relate those country values to real country names, which wasn't always possible. Uh, same with Global Population Dynamics Database, the Plant Trait Database, Globi, which is a community composition database, GBIF, uh, and then these, these two, remember I told you that there is global information available already via remote sensing. Okay, so red is lots of information, black 
and white and pale colors are uh, relatively little information. This is, this is on log scale, so we're talking massively less information than where you see red. That's GenBank, that's the genetic composition EBV. There's data from um, three data sets. I misspelled comadre, that's inexcusable. Um, so this is the, po the species populations uh, EBV. A species traits EBV. Community composition. And GBIF. And then this is an effort to put all of those together into one index. And so essentially what we did was to take a principal components analysis at the level of country where the, the uh, input variables were the relative scores for each of the, of the four EBVs for, that don't have global information. And essentially that first principal component summarizes the major axis of variation. And it goes again from uh, dark colors with relatively little information to bright red with lots of information. I'm just gonna ask you guys a, a question. Are you happy with this? Does this make you comfortable given that you are based in Africa? Okay, Fatima is smiling right now because she's been part of the uh, entity that has produced a lot of this, the data that puts South Africa on the map. And uh, yeah. Jean and Alex should be smiling because this is a, an older slide, but Ghana and Benin have both become uh, better and better in this respect. Uh, thank um, you, but we, we need more efforts. Indeed we do. Um, what I'm concerned about is this. Um, about EVVs, two of them can be summarized at least partially worldwide quickly and pretty easily. The rest, I hope that I've convinced you, the rest take enormous amounts of work and investments of resources and time. Those remaining four EBVs are massively biased towards what we could call the global north. And that there are major gaps and it's particularly Africa. Uh, EBVs, they'll probably always be biased spatially, okay? Um, but they'll be biased spatially in ways that might worry us. And I'll come back to that in a moment. And so I would put to you that EBV-based policy and discussions really should be taken with a grain of salt because we run the risk that EBVs will underrepresent a place like Africa where the data are scanty. So I just want to go back to the list of, yeah, let's look at this one. Now, there's one last thing that I want you to be thinking about. I told you that these two are easy. And these four are hard, right? <clears throat> Remember that IPBES was the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and ecosystem services. Well, these four are the biodiversity ones. These two are the ecosystem services one, right? The ecosystem services EBVs can be addressed immediately, relatively easily. The biodiversity ones are tough. Okay, 
we don't have global population uh, dynamics data. We don't even have scientific names for the vast majority of species on earth. So how can we be, be building data sets if we haven't even named them? So basically what these maps say to us, us as a group of people who are interested in global biodiversity, especially that one, which gives you the overall trend, says to us that we've got a lot of work ahead of us in developing biodiversity data. It doesn't mean to even it out. I mean, we don't need to bring um, the US and Europe and Canada and Australia down. We need to fill the gap that exists for regions like, like Africa and Central Asia and parts of South America which is to say, evening it out is a matter of filling the gaps. And that depends on you guys. That depends on, on a next generation and a current generation of scientists, mostly based in Africa, leading the way towards develop, developing data resources that can essentially fill this hole that we see on this map of global uh, essential biodiversity variable data. So I'll stop there. Um, I'll give you a, a plug for please join our uh, Facebook group on um, biodiversity informatics. Um, I give you this link just because it's a nice way to get to the biodiversity informatics training curriculum. Uh, the BITC is something that uh, has been developed over the past 12 years uh, with collaboration from a bunch of people. Um, certainly, Alex and Jean have participated. Uh, I met Ben thanks to the BITC. Um, imagine that I meet a guy from Liberia in Ethiopia, right? Um, That's true. And uh, please, uh, it was a, a good occasion for us uh, say, to be in contact with you. And uh, also, we are encouraged to build the work with you and support you. So it is a reason, reason why we are, we are trying, actually, in Africa, OK, to help you expand the biodiversity informatics. So thank you for that opportunity. Well, uh, thank you all for your time and attention. And if you, if you have questions, uh, feel free to email me. Um, I will uh, make available my set of slides. I'll try to pull out a couple of key papers from the talk uh, and provide those to you. And I'll also put uh, this recording and the other recordings um, from the rest of this course uh, on, on YouTube so that you have access to them or that uh, if, they're, if they're useful to consult later. Any questions? I hope I haven't um, blown the whole time period. Ah, okay, I see from Layla. Um, please, what is the percentage of genetic composition data from Africa? Wow, um, I don't know the percentage, but I can show you that slide. Let's see. So this is only in GenBank, and there's probably more in the European data sets and in the, um, the Japanese data set. Um, and Chinese data set as well. Um, but basically each one of these color levels is an order of magnitude difference. And so that, that tells you not a percentage, but you know that the percentage is going to be low because you know dark, uh, dark charcoal color is one-tenth that of gray and that's one-tenth that of 
um, pallid orange. And that's, so it's gonna be an extremely low number, I'm sorry to say. Other questions? Please don't be shy about speaking up. Um, just a comment. Yeah. Thank, thanks very much for that great presentation. Um, yeah, and, and just to note that South Africa has mobilized quite a lot of biodiversity data through its various institutions. A huge amount of that is the bird data, as you obviously know, and for the rest of our colleagues just. But yeah, so from, from Africa, we do, of course, need still lots and lots of those data gaps filled. Um, and various initiatives also looking at that, such as IPIS as well, looking at templates and all kinds of things to be able to mobilize that data. And GBIF also having the biodiversity information for development initiative as well. So those that initiative providing some funding. And so many of our countries on the continent are tapping into some of that funding to fill those data gaps. Um, yeah, so there's quite a lot of interesting projects. Um, if people are interested to look at that, different taxonomic categories in different geographic areas across the continent. Um, and so what we what also aim, what another initiative that of IPES is to get those templates ready and to engage various groups um, to also mobilize information. But there's also initiatives with IPES where they are also trying to connect with the funding agencies to be able to do that. Um, yeah, so just a, an add on to that. So I'm glad also that this information fits into those EBVs and, and for reuse, et cetera. Thanks, Tom. That was really a good, great presentation. Thanks for that. So somebody's asking, how much has technology influence the advanced level of data gathering outside of Africa? Well, I think, I think technology has influenced um, worldwide. I mean, look at us. We are meeting, I don't, I, I don't know how many countries from across Africa are on this call, but just a few years ago, this would have been impossible. And by a similar token, um, the remote sensing data that are going to start producing literally millions to billions of records of individual species in, in very short order, those are global. Those will help Africa, not for all species, but for some species, those will help Africa as well. Um, GPS units, in improving the quality of our georeferences, that's, that's decades old, but not many decades old. Um, so I, I think technology has has made a huge difference. Um, you know, uh, probably half of the data in in GBIF come from eBird, and eBird is all about you know bird watchers having these things. You know, when I was a little kid, we used to watch Star Trek, and we used to be totally envious of what were they called tricorders. Well, we have a lot of those things right here. I can call, you know, Alex in Ghana anytime. I can take a picture. I have a GPS unit. And a lot of us have these. Uh, probably all of you have these. And so that's, that's a pretty big technology assist. And that's pretty neat. I, I do, I do want to make one, one point which is I probably have come across a little pessimistic and critical. And yeah, I, I will tell you what I think and I will tell you what I believe. If, I, if I'm not sure or if I'm not, um, if I'm not uh, confident in something, I'll try to tell you that as well. But my point is, yes, I'm critical of GBIF and GeoBon and IPBES. But I wouldn't be working in this field if I didn't see hope, which is to say, I may be critical of what they or we 
including critical of what I am doing right now. But I see a lot of hope into the future. You know, it was 23 years ago, and I, got, I was fortunate enough to be present. 23 years ago, we connected the first two biodiversity databases. It was my, my bird collections database with a sister collections database in Mexico City. And for the first time in 1997, you could do one search on the internet and get back data from both collections. And in 23 years, that has developed and developed and developed. And the amount of data, you saw it every 42 years, the, da the, the data available online right now, tenfold more data. Okay? So it's exciting. It's really exciting that in two decades, resources like GBIF can come into existence. That's really, really cool. I'm more critical of the frameworks that we use to analyze those data or the frameworks that we use to use those data. Some of you know that I've put tons of time into ecological niche modeling. That's one framework that we can use to analyze and interpret those data, not the only one. Um, but we need to have effective conceptual frameworks that allow us to achieve those big policy goals. So let's say that um, the minister of the environment of your country comes to you or comes to probably the president of your university and says, I've got these natural resources people breathing down my neck. And the, the, the uh, Minister of Exterior Relations is in the CBD and, and he's saying that I need to do something. I need a, a, a prioritization of biodiversity threat across this country. Can you do this for me? And you say, huh, let me check the literature. And you go out and you look at Red List Index and Living Planet Index and all that, and you say, uh-oh, nobody's done it. So I have to do it. So I think that's the challenge. The challenge is developing those effective indicators that can work not just at a global scale, but not be downscaled to more relevant resolutions like within your countries and my country, um, but that also can be developed anywhere for any region. And there's some progress, not enough, but I think that's, that's fodder for your careers uh, it'll, I'll certainly be active as long as I'm active. And I certainly won't have come to anything comprehensive or final in my work in that area. But that's, that's a challenge. That's a massive scale challenge, not just to produce the data, which I think we're doing pretty admirably, but to use the data intelligently and in the right frameworks. That, I think, is the bigger challenge. Any other questions? OK. Hey, Stone. Uh, uh, Amy Tope yeah. has a, a hand raised. All uh, right. Thank go you very ahead, much. Please. Go ahead. OK, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. And thank you so much, um, Professor Peterson, for the brilliant presentation. Um, I just want to sort of happen on your last comment about, um, you know, potential requests from um, policymakers, you know, about, um, you know, biodiversity information, you know, 
that they could use to um, perhaps negotiate and things like that. I'm more of an environmental toxicologist anyway, but I also work a lot with, um, I mean, I'm in zoology department. And these are issues that come up, particularly within the project that we are doing at the moment. And I just wanted to ask, um, the truth is that we know that some of these, well, a lot of these information are actually available. But it seems a lot of the time that um, they're not similar or standard reporting frameworks or templates. And so because it's not there, it's difficult to mine the information that you require when you're doing the um, literature review or searching in order to you know, assess the information and provide to the policymaker. So I want to ask, with respect to biodiversity, do we have such you know, standard reporting guidelines or frameworks or templates that, you know, going forward, researchers, particularly in resource, um, you know, poor areas like Africa, can actually use in reporting their standard, you know, um, journal publications, so that even while we wait for funds to go into the field and get this data, the ones that we have already can actually be used, you know, uh, more usefully. That's my question, sir. Thank you very much. That's a really, really good question. Um, if, you know, imagine that, that uh, it's a terrible thing, but imagine we had a pandemic that locked us down and kept us home for a year, right? Or two years or whatever. What could we do with the existing information? And your question speaks exactly to that. If we want to go out and try to mine the information for the information that exists out there in the world right now, as you said, it's very heterogeneous. Now, I think there's one shining example that is an exception, and that is Darwin Core. So out of all of the six EBVs, looking just at that one with species populations, and out of all the pieces of species populations, looking just at primary occurrence data, we have this thing called Darwin Core. And this is a really neat standard content structure. And so the Darwin Core uh, has a whole bunch of, um, of descriptors. And essentially what this is, is exactly that structure that you're asking for, for primary biodiversity information. And Darwin Core was, was developed. I was present at the meeting. It was developed about two kilometers from where I'm sitting right now. And it's been extended. It is now an international standard. So it's an iOS standard. Uh, but Darwin Core gives you that, that structure so that everybody can put their data in this format and then get data in and out of this format very quickly and easily. So that's one of the key reasons why GBIF has been able to uh, grow so big so quickly. Now, uh, the problem is um, doing that for the rest of these variables. And so this is a, this is a challenge which is in the world of ontologies, okay? And so for example, here is an ontology for anatomy. And I say, I. Well, within this concept, sorry, within this concept of I, I can look at what is an I. Well, it's, it's a sensory organism, organ, organ. It's part of the sensory system, and it goes all the way up to a full organism. Um, and then within I, uh, we can see different types of eyes, okay? But this essentially shows me the relationship between different concepts. So for example, a, a population of individuals that makes up a species, that is also a population of individual occurrence records, right? But it is also 
part of a geographic range of a species. Okay, so we, in the same way I showed you with the eye being part of something and made up of something, these, these concepts relevant to biodiversity have upward and downward relationships. And I think the key to exactly what you're asking for is this linkage. It's essentially developing ontologies. And if you get into the world of, ont of ontologies, there is nothing more boring in the world. You will literally roll your eyes back into your head and fall asleep, but they are crucial, okay? Because that might allow you to take primary occurrence data and turn them into population data effectively and rigorously. It might allow you to um, take range maps and turn those into population distribution. It's complicated, it's messy, but it's feasible. If you have a good map of how different data map onto different other data. Okay, looks like Jean has his hand up. Thank you, thank you very much. Don, first of all, I want to, to thank you very much for all your support for uh, Africa. With this field of uh, biodiversity informatics, uh, let's say is uh, relatively new, but led by you towards Africa, really. And uh, yes, the lesson learned from your the course is that <clears throat> we are still delayed, really delayed behind in Africa and uh, the challenge uh, for us is really uh, not only to publish more data, but also use relevantly data, as you said. And it's a matter of capacity building. And uh, I'm very happy for what you are doing already. We are trying to support your efforts. And then uh, what we need is uh, our investment in the new generation so that they can take over our efforts. And uh, yes, thank you very much. We are aware that uh, we need more capacity building to the new generation so that they can take over the, let's say, the, yes, the challenge and come, let's say, overcome the challenge. Uh, so uh, what I want to say is that, uh, yes, uh, as you know, with your support, we develop a master program of biodiversity informatics in, uh, in Benin, and it's ongoing. Uh, let's say in the coming uh, weeks, uh, the, the second batch of, of students will uh, defend their uh, thesis. And as I told you, there are some, uh, at least now two, uh, for their PhD that are engaged in, in their PhD, and thank you for your support for that. And uh, yes, uh, my, as I told you, my uh, let's say willing is that uh, we are quite still quite connected to your team so that you have updated <laughs> you have updated scientists so that uh, we can together yes take over uh, let's say the challenge and try to overcome the challenge i thank you again and uh, yes we need this course in a uh, type of course in africa and uh, i thank you very much and thank alex also for that opportunity you gave us to, to follow this course. Thank you very much. Okay. That has been excellent. That has been great. I don't see any hands or hand up now. Um, so I would like to at this time use the opportunity once again to thank town enormously for such an informative uh, section. I do hope and believe that we have all benefited from this and the attendance has, or participation has been very encouraging. 52 people from various parts of Africa, which is good. And um, we look forward to the next sections and uh, uh, the 
last minute interactions really shows the interest of participants in the course. And I do believe that uh, by the end of the three day period, we will have enjoyed much of the course and how to mobilize data and not just how to mobilize the data, but with insights about how to use those data to inform decision making, to inform conservation and sustainable management within Africa and widely uh, conserved biodiversity globally. And so once again, I thank you all uh, for coming and I look forward to seeing you again on Wednesday, same time. And it has been a very, very enjoying moment. Thank you all. So bye-bye. Uh, have a good evening, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Alex in town. Bye. Bye, town. Thanks once again.